Shalom, brothers and sisters. This week's Thursday's thought, I'm going to continue in my series, I'm bearing my testimony to the various people that the Lord called to continue the work that is the movement known as the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, as the Lord has named it via Joseph Smith Jr. by Revelation. This week I'm going to talk about the Church of Jesus Christ, the Cutlerites, and Alpheus Cutler. And this is a very interesting one for a number of reasons. For one, they're very small. I think there's only like four to nine of them left at this point. But they're also one of the oldest. They've been around for a very long time. To kind of give you a little summary, you're going to have to look into this more yourself. I'm not going to give like an actual lesson on the Cutlerites. But basically, there's a section of Doctrine and Covenants that says, and it's uh, in Doctrines of the Saints, it's section uh, 78. In the Community of Christ Doctrine and Covenants, it's 107. And in the Salt Lake City Church, the Brighamite Sect, and their branches, it's 124. Now, looking at this particular revelation, it says, starting in verse 34 for Doctrines of Saints, verse 10D for Community of Christ, and verse 28 for the Salt Lake City Church, there's not a place on the earth, and I'm going to be paraphrasing this, it's kind of long, there's not a place found on the earth where he may come and restore again that which was lost unto you, or which he had taken away, even the fullness of the priesthood. For a baptismal font is not upon the earth that they, my saints, may be baptized for those who are dead. For this ordinance belongs in my house, it belongs in the temple, and cannot be accepted to me only in the days of your poverty, when you, wherein you are not able to build a house unto me. So, talking obviously about baptisms of the dead. And in the next verse, verse 36, for Doctrines of the Saints, 10F1 for the Community of Christ, and 31A for the Salt Lake City Church, I command you, all ye my saints, to build a house unto me. So there's a command to build a temple. Then it continues on, I grant you, and this is, this is the important part, I grant you a significant time to build a house unto me, and during this time of your baptism shall be acceptable unto me. But behold, at the end of this appointment, your baptisms of the dead shall not be acceptable unto me. And if you do not do these things, at the end of the appointment, you shall be rejected as a church with your dead, saith the Lord your God. Now, it goes on, but I'm going to stop there. And I have a couple of thoughts on this. Number one, there is no date. There's no due date. The Lord doesn't say if it's not done by this time. It just says by a significant time. And I would say that... The saints, in my understanding, is they did waste a little bit of time. They ended up building some other buildings. They did some other projects when they could have been focusing on the Nabu Temple. And in my mind, that time really would have been the death of Joseph Smith, Joseph and Hiram. When the Lord took them, obviously the time was up because the church was destroyed. It was destroyed from without and from within. We had, from without, people killing the leaders and, and members. And from within, we had the schism with everyone fighting over who's supposed to lead. And even today, that battle still continues with people saying, you know, low here and low there. So, Alpheus Cutler, I don't know when the date was for him, but he believed that that date had come. And so even though he originally joined the Brighamites, he left them. And he wasn't really, I don't even know if you really count him as being with them. He never went out to Utah uh, he was in a, in a mission with uh, Native Americans. And so I, I don't really know how how much contact you really have with them. But I do know that various apostles and people in that particular sect saw him as a threat. And they said, look, either you come and, and be with us or we're excommunicating you. And I'm, I'm making a long story short here. And so he was out and he may have already left before he was excommunicated. That's one thing that, I mean, their church still does this. People leave and they're like, well, we got to excommunicate you now. It's like, why are you excommunicating me? We, I left a long time ago, but it's just something that they do. I, I don't get it. Regardless, uh, Alpheus Cutler claims that Joseph Smith told him that if he saw that when he saw a sign in the heavens, two crescent moons touching each other, that that was a sign from God that he was supposed to restore the church of Jesus Christ to the earth. Um, I don't know how you see two crescent moons in the sky because we only have one moon, so I don't know the details on all this. Regardless, he believes he saw that sign. 
and he started his church. Did he have keys? Yes. He was a member of the Council of Seven, which I believe was either adjacent to or some way in correlation with the Council of Fifty. He may have been a member of the Council of Fifty. I'm not sure. He is mentioned in the Doctrine and Covenants. So we know that he had contact. We know that he had keys. If nothing else, he at least had keys to run a mission. So he had some keys. And if as long as you're an elder or high priest, which he must have been at least an elder, if not a high priest, then he had enough keys to start a church. So I have to bear testimony that if he felt called of God and people felt called to follow him, then that is enough. I am obviously going to disagree with him on this idea of he was the only way. You know, to me, Christ is the only way. But one thing that's interesting is I actually, in 2019, I had the opportunity to meet with the Cutlerites and worship with them. And I, I love them. They were a great group. They are a great group. I shouldn't say were. When I visited them, that was a, it was very pleasant to meet them. Um, they gave a sermon where they talked about our message, where they talked about their history. But the thing that really stood out to me was they have the same mission as the fellowship. They believe that all these things have been sent out and they need to be brought back in. Now, whether or not that's what Cutler believed, I don't know. And what's going to happen to them next? Are they going to die out? I don't know. But I will say that I received a revelation. And uh, this is Doctrines of Saints 2H. I received it in um, February 18th of 2020. And in it, it said point blank, we know the Lord accepts this church as a valid church in his name because the revelation says and the church of jesus christ as organized by my servant john alpheus cutler they have been awaiting this day that they might impart upon my people the treasures i have given them to watch over and i don't know if you're familiar with with masonry or not but if you are there's a story of uh, a temple worker from solomon's temple's name i believe is, is Hiram something and uh, Basically, the idea is that he's murdered because he wouldn't give up the secrets of the temple. I feel like this particular branch of the faith is kind of like a version of that story. They are keepers of this temple secret. Some people, I've read that some people believe that Brigham Young actually stole the temple ideas from Cutler. And then change them further to, you know, he's, Joe Smith got so far, Cutler got some more, and then Brigham Young took it further. Uh, I've also heard the opposite, that they may have some, it may be the same, it may be altered version of the original Brighamite temple rituals. I don't know. But either way, I, I think that that could be one of the treasures that they're holding on to. I think one of the other treasures they're holding on to, though, and this is the thing that is the most impressive to me, is they live the United Order. A lot of Restorationalist churches, not just Latter-day Saints, but just Restorationalist churches in America altogether, because of the scripture in, in Acts 2 where it says they had all things in common, they, they really wanted to focus on this, and they all died out long before now. The fact that the Cutlerites, you know, they got gutted when Joseph Smith III joined the reorganized church and became their leader. A lot of, they came in with missionaries and, and I believe Joseph Smith III actually met with Cutler when he was older. Um, but a lot of people left, but Cutler refused to join the reorganized church. And so they still stood strong. And I understand why he wouldn't join because he accepted Nauvoo doctrines that Joseph Smith III rejected. So I kind of feel like if they could have gotten together, they, they could have actually had a more complete gospel than, than what either of them have currently. But that did not happen. Um, obviously, Community of Christ is not going to be living the United Order or doing temple rituals, and the Cutlerites are not planning on leaving that behind. And I don't know, maybe, maybe they will give up at some point and join. I, I don't know, but at this point, we know that they are holding some sort of treasure for us, whether that's the temple rituals or it is the secret of how to actually live the United Order. I don't know. But I will tell you this. If they do end up dying out, I know that the Lord is going to bless us with through revelation with the knowledge that we need that their sect has been holding on to for us. It is my prayer that they will work with the fellowship 
and that they will share these things with the rest of the Latter-day Saint movement. But that's not something that we can force on anyone. It's something we can invite them to, but it's not something that we can demand of anyone. So this is a little bit of a, a, a different one because, again, I'm not as familiar with the Cutlerites as I am any of the others, but the Lord spoke to me about them. So we know that the Lord did, in fact, set the Cutlerites apart and give them a mission. He gave them a key to this puzzle that is the Latter-day Saint movement so that we can be one again. If you're not familiar with the Cutlerites, I would ask you to look into them. You can start on Wikipedia. They have a book you can purchase that, that talks about uh, talks about uh, Alpheus Cutler. Sorry, name escaped me for a second there. And, and I will tell you, there is a little bit of controversy. This is one thing I did want to mention I almost forgot about. They are not keen on polygamy. They claim that Cutler was not a polygamist, even though there is some that say that he was. Uh, I know that there's some temple records within the Brighamite sect that show that he was a polygamist. They claim that was a lie. So, I mean, they don't ordain women. So there are some things that, you know, we as Latter-day Saints, are, we always butt heads over something. And, and that is one of the touchy subjects for them, is, is the polygamy issue. Um, I, again, will say, I think we as Latter-day Saints worry way too much about polygamy. I've talked about that in other videos. You're welcome to go watch them. But regardless, I, I want to make it very clear that I don't care whether he was a polygamist or not. That is completely irrelevant to the mission of the Cutlerites. The question now is, how will they move forward? There's one other thing I want to mention before I, I, my, I end my testimony here, and that is there are a lot of people who say, well, you know, you can tell how true a church is by its size. And, you know, well, if that's true, then we should all become Catholics if we're Christian or Muslims because they're, we're a small movement. Even if you put us all together, we're not very big. They do not do missionary work. And when you look at the Brighamite Church, the Salt Lake City Church, I, I really shouldn't call them the Brighamite Church because there's so many Brighamite churches. So the Salt Lake City Church, they mandate that boys, males from age, I think it's like 18 to 24, go on missions. And now they have the same thing for, for women. Now, technically, they should be growing exponentially with all these people there, and they don't. They grow, and they're big, and that's awesome. That's great. But you can't use that as a testimony when it's literally, uh, of why they're the one true church, when it's literally what they're known for. It's what they do. The Colorites, the fact that they were able to survive this long without doing missionary work, to me, that is a miracle in and of itself. I genuinely believe that if these other churches would have had a missionary program as strong as the Brighamite Church and had the financial resources backing them up that, the, that they do, so that, you know, hiring marketing firms and things like that to get that outreach so people think, I'm sorry, so people would stop thinking that they're the only Latter-day Saint church, the only Mormon church out there. I think these other branches of our faith would have a real chance of really showing up to the table with a lot of people. Unfortunately, one of the things that we do is we farm from each other. And that really gets people to leave the movement more than it gets them to move over to other parts of the movement. We shouldn't be telling our fellow Latter-day Saints, hey, your church is wrong. We're the true Joseph Smith replacement. We're all, it's a shattered mirror. It's a broken mirror. We're all a part of that same movement. So I, I want to bury my testimony that the Lord has kept them, the Cutlerites, around to this point for a reason. That they are not an insignificant part of our movement, but rather they are a very significant part of our movement that is potentially about to be lost forever. And I will tell you that if that happens, I will be one of those that mourns the loss of this great organization. Because it doesn't matter how small they are. What matters is how they serve the Lord. And my understanding is that they have been serving the Lord faithfully for a very, very long time. And so I pray for them. 
And, and I would encourage you, they don't do missionary work. I'm going to do some missionary work for them. If you don't belong to a branch of our faith that feels comfortable to you, you don't feel comfortable where you are. You, you're a lost saint. You, you're home, spiritually homeless. I invite you to look into the Cutlerites. Explore what they have to offer. See if they are a good fit for you. See if their united order is something that you can live. Are you ready for that higher law? Because the rest of us as Latter-day Saints, we aren't. We've proven that time and time again because we've failed at it over and over and over. What is it? What is their secret that they're able to do it successfully? And is that something that you can live and you can be a part of? Is there a way that we can keep this part of the movement, this branch of the movement alive? Is the Holy Spirit telling you that this is something that God's calling you to? Now, they're probably going to be upset that I said this if they ever see this video. But that's my mission. My mission, we are an ecumenical movement here at the Fellowship of Christ. And we've got to keep these branches of the faith alive. So, I would encourage you to study the Cutlerites. Pray on their message. And even if you're not called to join them, Maybe you're called to testify to the truth of their branch of our shared faith, just as I just have. So that's my Thursday thought, and I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.